This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. Welcome everyone. This is the week of September 3rd. This is The Dime. This week we're talking about something that is near and dear to our heart, the legacy market. We have mentioned the legacy market before. Kellen, sometimes we refer to it as the traditional market. The legacy market when referenced in cannabis industry are cannabis companies who are considered pre-legislation companies. Kellen, do you agree with this term that that's how they should be described? And if not, can you share some more details about the illicit market? Just, yeah, so just so we're on the same page, traditional legacy, this is the black market, right? This is literally people selling a schedule one narcotic without a license to sell said schedule one narcotic so just so we're all on the same page and that is what the legacy market is right is people selling things without any licenses and the government knowing about it and so as far as its importance to the industry i mean it is the only reason the industry is around right now right is because there was a thriving black market for the last 50 years so, I mean, the black market is what the industry is. And the only reason people know how to grow cannabis is because the black market was around. I mean, I don't know if you have any experience in the legacy market at all, or if you've seen, I mean, maybe in college, right? Everyone would go purchase cannabis in the in an eighth format um, and buy an eighth, right? <laughs> A little shout out to that uh, eighth revolution. But uh, <laughs> um, they would go buy an eighth and that was how the cannabis market survived is on cash, right? And so that I think is everyone's experience with the legacy market. Some people probably have a much deeper experience with the legacy market. Is that kind of your the extent of your experience, Brian? Yeah, well, here in New York, for sure, right? We only have the medicinal side. And from my experience, it's predominantly with the traditional legacy market. I have buddies in New York City who get it from the traditional market and it's a crazy service a guy shows up with a backpack full of stuff and it's like a very professional style delivery service and i wonder how quickly that will change as new york comes on board with new regulations because we've seen it in california where the legacy market is still thriving and there's other businesses that are doing well that are legal as well and when you break it down even further it must be tough for these operators to make these financial decisions, knowing that paying taxes, licensing and fees, when they could just continue operating the way they are and really, really help themselves grow. So I, I, I know there's tons of dilemmas with these organizations. And as we continue to encourage them to move forward, I wonder if government recognizes that the best way for the industry to thrive is for everyone to regulate, pay their taxes, and to be above ground. But I'm sure the traditional market will never go away in full. Kellen, the legacy market is vastly important to the legal market. But specifically in your mind, do you think it impacts it negatively or positively? I think it impacted it positively to begin, right? Because at the end of the day, once legalization occurred, if there weren't people out there that had been doing legacy work, then you would have a ton of companies coming in. And right now, if you look at like all of these companies that are backed by institutional funding, technically those companies would have spent a lot more money and lost a lot more money if the legacy market hadn't been around prior to them coming in with their checkbook, right? Because they would have come in with their checkbook they would have written really, really big checks like they already did, and no one would have known what was going on. They would have failed 10 times more than they already did fail. They would have had 10 times more learning uh, than they would have, and learning's really expensive, right? And so it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Like, they're all mad now because the legacy market's still around, and it's, it's uh, hurting their bottom line because consumers are going to the legacy market to buy higher quality product for cheaper prices because those companies aren't paying taxes or those... I guess cartels is the way that we should refer to them are not paying taxes and they're doing illegal legal work where there's, you know, 90% profit margins. But on the other side of that sword is the fact that the company that's legal now that paid all their licenses had to hire someone who was working in the legacy market prior. And that person got the opportunity to come work in a legal space with legal money and build a legal company, right? But that company is only functioning because of what that individual learned in the legacy market. And so it's a really sticky conversation, if you will. And there's definitely opinions on both sides. 
I think early on the legacy market was very, very important to the industry. I think now, especially in like Colorado, where the industry has been around for five, five plus years and people now that are operating in the legacy market still that have chosen not to go legal at that point, I don't really, I mean, they had their opportunity. Now you're just doing illegal stuff. And I think that it's time to either shut your doors or you're now going to be classified as a, a serious criminal that needs to be uh, pursued by the, the, the law in my opinion. I mean, how, how do you see it, Brian? Is that, is that similar? How do you, how you see it from a benefit and a con aspect, I guess? I think that's a, a really strong underappreciated point that learning is expensive. And when these large scale investors write their checkbooks for somebody with experience and they have to dabble the understanding that if somebody writes eight plus years growing experience, good chance they grew up in the legacy market learning. And I, I think if you're an institutional investor, you're kind of delicately balancing that line with like, I want to run a legal operation, but I need people with experience. And where do they get that experience? Maybe the don't ask, don't tell policy. I'm not really sure how that works. But I, I think that's a really important point that learning is expensive. And the experience in the legacy market is so crucial to helping these, this industry thrive and kind of expedite that facilitation of the ready, set, go. Growing is hard. It's an art. It's a science. And as you know, some of the best growers, they, they can feel the plant and they, they want to be there out there with the plants, kind of touching it and feeling it and knowing what, what their children per se need or the girls need, whatever Nate would call that in his experience. So I 100% agree with the, you. And I think that's a really underappreciated point that some probably don't recognize. So we're going to go information time. Do, Kellen, can you name any legacy brands that have changed into a legal market that have kind of piggybacked off of old branding strategy and now kind of levers that into new? I do know a couple companies that have. I'm hesitant to name names or anything like that. But yeah, the, the short answer is I'm definitely aware of a lot of companies that use similar sales strategies. Um, at the end of the day, high quality material from a flower perspective will always sell. Um, and a lot of people understand that, right? And so you see a lot of, there's kind of two different approaches from the cannabis space, if you will, that you have. And it's either small boutique, high quality, right? Which is these really indoor, super controlled, in super controlled environments that produce very high end bud, if you will. And that's what they're going after is that high end, really dense, beautiful looking bud, almost like they're growing roses, right? And then the other side of the coin is people that are just growing it for money, right? As, as an agricultural crop, they're planting as many acres as the state will let them. And it's all outdoors. It's as cheap as they can grow it. And it's probably all going to extract, right? And so they're just growing a crop out outside. And that's what they're pursuing from an extraction perspective, right? And so both of those kind of models were taken from the legacy market and now applied to the legal market. And this is why we have really high end bud and those kind of companies, as well as vape, vape cartridges and all of the edibles out there and all of these really cool sublinguals and tinctures and sprays and lotions. All of those are directly tied to the ability of people to take all this outdoor crop and extract it into the active chemicals in the plant, right? Which is the THC and the terpenes and that whole entourage effect, right? And so both of those and all the products are definitely rooted in the legacy market. I mean, do, do you see it the same way, Brian? Absolutely. Absolutely. Prediction time. Today, 45 announces cannabis is legal. What happens to the legacy market tomorrow? Nothing. It dies in, in a year, though. In the legacy year. market is only around because it is illegal to cultivate cannabis in, in New York and all of these East Coast states, period. I agree, but my timeline is a little different. I think the legacy market continues indefinitely, but it really is less and less apparent as it goes on because at the end of the day, if I can walk into 7-Eleven and grab myself a pack of smokes, or I got to call Joe from down the street who lives in his mom's basement still to drop me off some stuff. I probably do either, depending what's easiest, but I'll probably get a delivery service, not going to 7-Eleven if we're going to be honest. So I'd probably continue purchasing from the, the store, but I wouldn't hesitate if it was harder to come by. But 
it would be less and less likely for me to go from Joe. My opinion on it is completely different because well, it's a little, it's so, I totally get what you're saying because I was like that when in college, years. in college, it went legal in Colorado, right? And I moved back and I went to the dispensary. I was like, oh, that's cool. And I still had my like dealer, if you will, right? In college. Wow. And then slowly over the course of like a, a one year period when I was living back in Colorado, I literally just was like, it's not even worth calling him and dealing with that. And if he's home, if he's not, I have to work yeah, with this good point. That's Instead, good point. at that point, it's literally like slowly, like unfortunately for the legacy market, like you, you put up a store where someone can walk in anytime they want during normal business hours. And you just, it's a game changer, right? Like yeah. you walk I, in, that's a good point. Out, and I'm, you have a card, you get points. Like they're like, you play all these other like sales, the games. And like, I don't get points with my dealer. It's not like I, I bought five bags and he gave me one for free. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's not that's how a good point. That's a good point. That's a good and point. So it, it, and from my experience in Colorado, every single one of my friends that are heavy, heavy users, none of them have drug dealers anymore. Right. It's all just like what I go to the dispensary, I do this, right? Like I get this. And like the brand loyalty has started to form over those five years. And like I like this product, I don't like this product. Like, and no one has drug dealers anymore, right? In Colorado, because you can just go to a store. And so it has really, really put a huge damper on the legacy market in Colorado. California's yeah. a little different because it's really, really big and there's way more people and the laws are really terrible, if we're gonna be honest, and they're just not written to favor the legal market. And that's why the legacy market has continued to thrive as well as California kind of has the pipeline to the East Coast, if you will, from a, a legacy market standpoint. And so th that'll continue to support them um, indefinitely until the East Coast kind of goes legal and that same change occurs within the culture, in my, my opinion. But th that's just what, what I've seen being back in Colorado. Um, well, I'm excited for the future. Thank you so much for <laughs> making me more optimistic. I think for me, right, my, my experience as a consumer is only we, um, rooted in the, the aspects of when I visit the West Coast, how easy it is. And when I'm here, I don't have that type of availability. So I'm sure as things develop, I'll probably feel very different about that. And the number one complaint I hear all the time, which is so funny, people always bring this up to me once I find out I work in the space is, why is it so expensive? And it's like, I don't set the prices, dude. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know why you paid what you paid. Like, why do you walk in a high-end Nordstrom or, or Louis Vuitton? Like, because you, you, I didn't set those prices either. So I, I think when people are like, I can get it from Joe around the corner for $30, or I can go into a Spencer and spend $75. Like, why would I want to do that? And I mean, I don't know why you want to do that, but I, I wonder as the, as the availability kind of gets larger exposure here, the prices will probably come down a little bit with federal legislation, hopefully, and then there won't be such a large disparity in prices, or if there are, there are characteristics to define why something is one way versus the other. I agree. Cool. Thanks everyone for watching.